As we all know, Lydia Davis has a strong interest for visual arts. In her first book of essays, several chapters deal with paintings and photographies. John Mitchell's Les Bleuets, Joseph Cornell's work, Harley Tourist photographers, or Alan Cutt's recent paintings. In this chapter about Alan Cutt, she says, there is a great freedom within constraints, even perhaps more freedom than with no constraints at all. Cutt's recent paintings, as the most of them made of two colored rectangles with many bars drawn in another color. Every painting is shaped by these formal constraints, but inside the field they define, the painter freely chooses colors and the position of the bars, exploring never-ending possibilities. What I'd like to show today is how, in some cases, the interest Lydia Davis has for visual arts, and more specifically for abstract paintings, not only influences, but shapes her own way of writing. And to do so, I'd like to read with you The Cows, perhaps one of the most experimental short stories she's ever written. The Cows is now collected in Cantonment, a book of short stories published by Picador in 2014. But it has first been published as a chapbook by Saraband Press in 2011, with photographers by Seocott, Stephen Davis, and Lydia Davis. The title, The Cause, tells us precisely what the short story is about, a long depiction of three cows in a field, through space, through space and time, through the field they are kept within, and through the seasonal cycle. A depiction of three, of three cows and of nearly 4,500 walks. In All I Can Say About Three Cows, an online TV interview produced by Louisiana Channel, Lydia Davis explains how she got the idea of such a text. We've moved to the country, further out of the country, I should say, and across the road was an empty field, and I thought it would be nice if there were animals there, but there were no animals. Then, six months later, just by chance, the neighbor brought three heifers, three young cows. I was always looking out the window where I live and seeing them in the field, and rather gradually began to not think about them, I found very interesting. I always do make a note of anything that I find interesting. So, at the right beginning, there is something like a spontaneous, natural curiosity for free heifers, without the idea to write something about them, or at least without a precise idea of what she could do with such a material. And indeed, she didn't write the cause all at once in the following days or weeks. It took her three years, three years during which she was, she was staring at the cause day after day, month after month. And as she says, I was surprised that there were so many different things to notice about these three cows in the field. In the end, we have with the Saragon Press original publication, a 32 pages book and with Canton Mount, in which the photographs haven't been reproduced, a 15 pages short story, a very long short story by comparison with those Lydia Davis usually writes. The two versions, have the same setup and look, and look like nuts, with short paragraphs, sometimes just one sentence, no more than two lines, sometimes a dozen with one or two indents if needed. There are several other short stories in Canton Mount which look like nuts. It is a case, for example, of nuts during a long phone conversation with mother. Here, it is as if we were looking to real nuts on a piece of paper or a notebook. And there is a meaning effect because of the contrast between the long conversation the title promises and the short notes which are supposed to reflect what has been said. The first words, for some more, she needs pretty dress, seem to be something like an idea for a present. But thereafter, because the dress should be a cotton plus dress, we suppose, 
The daughter is playing with the letters of the word cotton, combining them in different orders. And of course, we guess she's doing that because she finds of no interest the conversation with her mother and she's bored. Another example with, I'm pretty comfortable, but I could be a little more comfortable. For more than six pages, we have dozens of one-line notes in which a narrator tells us what she feels, what she sees, what she hears. And there again, there is a link between the form and the meaning, because as the title, on, as the title underlines it, if she's trying to convince herself she's comfortable, in fact, she isn't. And this discomfort is partly expressed by the proliferation of knots, an unquiet stream of knots, which is also the stream of her consciousness. We have the same effect with, oh, I read as quickly as possible through my back issues of the TLS. For more than four pages, we have only quotations of the Times literary supplements, but mere sentences beginning alternatively with, I do want to read and I do not want to read. And thereafter, just noon phrases with the most often the least effect. The text looks one more time like notes, and we are one more time inside the mind of the writer. But here the goal is not only to mimic the reading as she did it, but also to express through the writing the idea of a quick reading. I could speak in the same way of the language of things in the house or local habits. But those examples are sufficient to illustrate what I will call the visual dimension of several Lydia Davis short stories. Since Roland Barthes and Maurice Blanchot, Maurice Blanchot's pioneer works, many things have been said about the fragment in contemporary literature. For Lydia Davis, it's obviously a very fruitful process. It's a way for her to better depict the situation, to better express what she has in mind by closely associating the note form with what she has to say. Lydia Davis is not only writing, if writing means to put sentences one after another. She's also setting up her writing because she also wants her reader to look at the shape of the text as if it was an object, a sculpture or a painting on the page. When she speaks, in her interview to read the channel of the reasons why she has written the cause, she insists above all on visual effects. First, she says that's because there were three of them rather than two or one. The three could take different positions with each other in relation to each other. And indeed, several paragraphers in a short story are dealing with the position of the cause, where they go or why they stay still, like this one. One thinks there is a reason to walk briskly to the far corner of the field, but another thinks there is no reason and stands still where she is. At first, she stands still where she is, while the first walks away briskly. But then she changes her mind and follows. She follows, but stuff stops halfway there. Is it that she has forgotten why she was going there? or that she has lost interest. She and the other are standing in parallel positions. She's looking straight away. There are many descriptions of their moves and positions like this one. And sometimes the writer speaks of the cause as if they were in a painting with a perspective, proportions, a background and a foreground and so on. Example. One of them is in the foreground and two are further back in the middle room between her and the woods. In my field of vision, they occupy together in the middle room the same amount of space she occupies alone in the foreground. Here we have to remember that the most often the writer was looking to the cows through a window whose frame is like the frame of a painting, opening in the wall a point of view, but a framed one, like a painting hanging on the wall. Another reason why she's been fascinated by the cows is because they were black. They might have been like brown or bright or, or brown and white. It would not. But it'd been so distinct against whatever they were standing against. And in the cows, there are indeed many lines about 
they have very deep black color, as she said in the interview, like this ones. They are a deep, inky, inky black. It's a black that swallows light. Their bodies are, are entirely black, but they have white on their faces. On the faces of two of them, there are large patches of white, like a mask. On the face of the third, there is only a small patch on the forehead, the size of a silver dollar. Moreover, very often she's thinking of the cause as a painter could do, in, term, in terms of lines and geometry, geometrical forms. Here is a first example. Lying down, seen from the side, her head up, feet bent in front of her, she forms a long, acute triangle. Her head, from the side, is nearly an isocellous triangle with a blunted corner where her nose is. And there is another example. The forelegs are more graceful than the back legs because they lift in a curve, whereas the back legs lift in a jagged line, like a bolt of lightning. But perhaps the back legs, while less graceful than the forelegs, are more elegant. It's because of the way the joints in the legs walk, whereas the two lower joints of the front leg bend the same way, so that the front leg, as it is raised from the curve, the two lower joints of the back leg bend in opposite direction, so that the leg, when raised, forms two opposite angles, the lower, the lower one gentle, pointing forward, the upper one sharp, pointing back. But with such a depiction, we are no longer in a figurative painting. We're in an abstract one. In several paragraphs, indeed, we have not one or two or three cows, but a part of a cow, or just their black, their black legs, or just bumps of ears and nose, white bumps of bone hips by a snowy day. Triangles, angles, and pictures of black. In any case, we have more the idea of a cause than a real one. In such a way that, as we progress in the reading, it seems that the words and paragraphs in the pages become like the cause in the field, a herd of words and paragraphs, a herd of black spots on the white paper. The text is not only telling us something about the cause, it is become, becoming a code, an idea of what is a code or a heart of codes. In the interview she gave to Louisiana Channel, Lydia Levy, speaking about language in literature, says that for her, the language should suit the subject. For the cause, it seemed appropriate for her to have what she calls a quiet, clean, simple language and even repetitive. She adds, that's why she tried to spare long and complicated words. We could say that because the subject of the cause is a simple, if not a minimalist one, but that's not all. As an example, she says she especially avoided the word ruminant because she thought it's a too long and too conceptual word. To write about ruminants without using the word referring to the class they belong to is perhaps funny, but it's also meaningful. Indeed, if the word ruminant is not used, the repetitive sentences in the cause produce nonetheless an effect of rumination. By doing so, Lydia Davis found a quite new and original way to depict the cause by inscribing in her writing what is one of the most distinctive features, rumination. But rumination has not only a concrete meaning. By looking all along to the cause, by noting where they are, or they move, how long they stand still, what part of them she sees at different hours, the writer was also ruminating in the met metaphorical sense of the word. So, reading the cause, we don't only perceive an abstract picture of them through the shape of the words and paragraphs, we also perceive how the writer was thinking to the cause, 
in a repetitive, subjective, compulsive way. So in the end, it appears that the text, with its not form, is not only an image of the code, but also a self-portrait of the writer, or at least of a way of thinking. But there is more. As Lydia Davis confesses in her interview, I was just interested in things like, oh, they can stand still for so long. I'm only standing still for a moment to observe them. I am very interested in the simplicity of their lives because across the road, my life is so busy, running here and there, doing this and that, and stopping one thing and starting, starting another one. It's hard for me to sit still without something to read in my hand. I haven't achieved what they have achieved. So the cause are also the perfect incarnation of a certain way of being, and perhaps of what it is to be in Lydia Davis' mind. The text then is not only an object to be seen, it is also an, ex an experience, an existential experience. It gives a concrete idea of what it could be to be able to empty one's mind and to do nothing but to be. To give an idea of what it is to be is not specific to this short story. It's obviously one of the most recurrent effects of Lydia David's short stories, and perhaps for her, one of the main reasons why she's writing. So, when it, had, when it has been first published by Sarah Van Kress in a, as a chapbook in 2011, the literary text wasn't here just to comment the photographers, as a caption could do at the bottom of a picture or a painting. And the photographers weren't here just to illustrate the text. Writing and photographers are one in front of the other as two different ways of dealing with the same topic. One, the photographers, in a figurative manner. The other, the literary text, in a more abstract or conceptual way, more inspired by modern paintings and by photography. It doesn't mean that there is a better way to deal with what we call reality or, from an aesthetic point of view, realism. But that writing has its own specificity and its own goal, as photography does. A goal Lydia Davis achieved with the cause in a very specific visual and conceptual way of writing Demonstrating one more time that if the main rule is to suit the subject, the processes a writer can choose to suit it have to be chosen as freely as possible without prejudice of what is or isn't literature. 